My name is Bethan and I run Orchid Corsetry. Some of you may have worked with us in the past, in which case, hello and thank you and we love you. And so I thought it would be quite nice to set up a YouTube channel because all the cool kids are doing it, but also because I think it's a really nice way to have a direct conversation with people. There's something a lot more personal about just being able to have a little chat, which is why I thought let's start this with a Q&A because a lot of people who contact me through social media and through Instagram have a lot of questions which I do answer on the blog but I appreciate that trailing through yards and yards and yards of text because I can't write anything in a short manner um, can be a bit daunting so let's answer your questions directly and see if we can't solve some corsetry conundrums and just get to know each other. So. <laughs> I'm super awkward and this is going to be really interesting because I don't really do video but you know I'll look forward to your feedback and getting better at this I suppose. Um, well I asked on Instagram and Facebook for your questions and you did not disappoint. There were some really great questions coming through. I had a feeling I would get the same question multiple times. No one sent the same question twice. It was wonderful. So I thought I've arranged this in some kind of way that I think might make sense. So our first question came from Hey Billy Bay, thanks Hey Billy Bay, and she said, what will your YouTube be about? Um, well, that's a really good question. <laughs> so partly the thought with this was that things are going a certain way with social media. I'm noticing particularly where I used to be able to post behind the scenes, I used to be able to post um, information about how I do things, pictures on mannequins, pictures on models, it was a lot more varied. It's narrowed down to the point where the only reaction that I really get is if it's a model. And I love model photos, obviously that's a huge part of what we do. But at the same time, it, I really want to share why I'm passionate about this and that's far more than a beautiful woman in a gorgeous setting. It's it's so much about the craft for me, it's about the engineering behind things. So I felt like this would be a really good place to talk to you about things like that, look into things more deeply perhaps. I feel like there's a greater attention span on YouTube, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but really I did want to hear from you and see what you respond to most on here. I seem to get a really great reaction to questions, so, you know, hopefully a bit more of this. Um, I would quite like to step into a few things like interviewing some of the really interesting people that I come across in my career, um, some of whom are fellow corset makers, so I'd like to keep it fairly on topic. But, um, for instance, my wonderful friend Alicia Amaya, who runs Amaya Couture. Alicia Amaya is not her name. I don't know why I can't. Alicia, who runs Amaya Couture, um, she is fairly local to me, so I was thinking, this is a great opportunity to have that tea and cake party we keep talking about, and record it, and ask her some questions about her amazing work. Um, yeah, I felt like that would be a fun thing to do here, but tell me what you want to see. That's the best thing to do here. <laughs> okay, so my next question comes from Dame T. Dame T is such a wonderful model. She recently became a client and you can see some photos of her in my work on our Instagram. Please follow us if you haven't already. Um, and also go and follow Dame T because she is phenomenal. Quite a striking woman. So Dame T wants to know about corset seasoning and upkeep. I'm really glad that somebody brought this up because I've seen a few videos floating around recently by makers who've been in the game for a long time who are not so sure that corset seasoning is necessary. I disagree. We're all in this with very different approaches, experiences. It's fine that we differ, it's all good. So I think that corset seasoning is important because this has been explained to me by someone who's far more sciencey than me and the way that they've put it is it's effectively the fibres slowly relaxing and steam moulding to your shape 
this is such a great opportunity for you to get used to the corset as well, which I'm all for gentleness when you are getting used to a corset. It's good for your body, it's good for the long-term life of your corset. Everyone's happy, just be patient, please. So how I would suggest going about this is having a maximum two inch reduction when you take your corset out of the box. So what you're looking for is just to very gently give that reduction a test, but you're not straining the corset. It will not be sitting close to you at the size if you're with the average reduction of four to six inches. That's fine, it's all good. But as you go through each day, start with two hours a day, increase that the next day to two and a half, to three, and just go on gently like that for two weeks. And I think after the first week, it's fine to start reducing that waist a little bit more. If you are taking a more extreme reduction, so above six inches, it's going to take you more than two to three weeks. Um, I have clients who take a 13 inch waist reduction and it takes them a while to break their corset in. Um, but I'm so grateful that they give that corset the time to do that because I think everyone benefits long term. Um, what else did I want to say about that? Upkeep. So upkeep with your corset. I've taken this to mean taking care of it generally. So I think it's really important for your skin, but also for the health of the corset to keep it aired out every time you use it. And by this, I mean lining out over the back of the chair. So the perspiration that's built up during that period of wear has a chance to just dissipate into the lovely clean air. Um, it's going to keep it fresher. It's going to mean that that lining is not staying damp for long periods of time. This is also why we advocate more than one corset if you wear your corsets day to day. Um, another really important tip is keeping it fresh, vodka spray. Um, and this has really been brought to my attention that um, our Muslim clients aren't able to use vodka spray, but just keep airing it out. The vodka spray, it's a very, very small amount. You're diluting it in a bottle. You're spraying this on the lining extremely lightly we're misting it we do not want that soaking through because you do not wash your corsets unless they are specifically built for that purpose so the vodka spray will kill the bacteria it's amazing it will change your life i promise you question three comes from danitron i am not saying that right i'm sorry um these are all people's instagram names by the way um danitron wants to know what brought you to corsetry um, and that's such a great question to have at the start of this, especially while the YouTube channel is quite new. Um, for everyone who's already heard this story, I'm so sorry. So me and my friends were gothic teenagers. We, this was like the early 2000s. It was still very much that classic image of Victoriana goth. It developed as time went on, you know, with the emo goths that was all coming in at that time. But for us, it was that beautiful, elegant, classic Victorian attire, the bustles, the structure. Just, I absolutely fell in love with it. Cradle of Filth videos were my world. And that damsel in distress look completely caught my imagination. So I started making little bits of clothing to make my wardrobe more interesting. My friend made a pair of patchwork jeans out of the just crazy, crazy, crazy things. They were all looking, it was all just really raggedy, Tim burton -y joy, it was wonderful. Um, I'm not sure my mum thought so when I was going on school bus, but you know, there we go, it's a long time ago now. Um, so that aesthetic of Victoriana has always been at the heart of my love for corsetry. It's that era of corsetry that I'm super drawn to. I think it's the point at which the, the technology was really coming in at that point. So the evolution in the styles and what was possible with waste reduction was just astronomically exploding. It was so exciting. And yes, the, the darkness of it, the the stories and the literature of that period, everything comes together so beautifully. Um, so I ended up doing an illustration degree rather than fashion, 
um, because drawing was such a huge part of my life and also because creating characters and writing was has always just been something that I do. So illustration was not really a natural path to corsetry, which is why I stayed there a year before realising that sewing under my desk was not really helping me to get my coursework done. So I left to set up all for corsetry when I was 19 and I have not looked back since day one. It has just been full of beautiful people keeping me very busy, expanding my horizons, teaching me new things and I love my job almost every day would be the very honest answer to that but you know I don't think anyone gets to have 100% wonderful days I love my job and I can't imagine doing anything else right now it's it's still completely in my heart um, so the other side of that is my dad is an engineer his dad was an engineer I feel the course tree is very much architecture and engineering there is there's something so intoxicating about that mix of tailoring and understanding the way to distribute pressure and how the slightest line change in a panel really affects the shape of the corset on the body. It's fascinating, it's addictive and yes, I if you haven't already been caught by the corset wearing bug, you will, I promise you. Very few people try a corset and don't fall in love with it. I promise you will love it. Our next question comes from a bloody mess podcast. You need to check these guys out. They refer to themselves as a badly researched crime podcast, um, true crime podcast. I would add an irreverent badly researched true crime podcast because there are no holds barred, <laughs> but they are two guys who are great friends, sometimes getting drunk, talking about serial killers and cults. It's so funny, it's so informative, and if, like me, you just can't get enough of the psychology of crime and people and why we do what we do, it's, it's a great, great, great way to get in touch with it. So please go and look for A Bloody Mess podcast on, I'm pretty sure they're on Spotify, they're definitely on Podbean, but go look. Um, so a bloody mess podcast wants to know, at what point did you decide to specialise in corsetry and what made you make that decision? So, um, demand, basically. <laughs> when I left my illustration course, my initial feeling was I am going to go make LARP costume. So if you don't know what LARP is, it is live action role play. This tends to be quite fantasy based, it's people meeting up in tents in a field with characters, fa fantasy, mythical creatures, different times, some are very, they're all very, very different systems. But because of my fascination with story and with character, um, it almost became, instead of illustrating the costumes for the people, I wanted to make the costumes. I wanted to make dryads and mermaids and forest spirits because you know, I'm a little hippie child, and there was so much joy in that idea of immersing yourself in a completely different world. Um, that thought didn't last for me. <laughs> I started trying to make headdresses and interesting pieces, but it was the corsets where my passion really was and also where the interest from clients really was. So it started off with one or two waspies that I'd made thinking, yeah, that's kind of cool. Um, they weren't, they weren't cool. Um, and people really went for them. So setting up on eBay, I, I'm fairly sure that at this time, which would have been 2006, I was the first person to start selling made to order corsets on eBay. I couldn't find anyone else doing it. And this was what launched my business. So <laughs> from this incredibly broad spectrum, I'm going to go with my tent and sell my fantasy costumes. It turned into, I'm going to make as many corsets as um, I possibly can because these orders are flowing in. So demand was really what pushed me there. Um, but again, coming back to that love of engineering, it, it far, it, no other form of dressmaking or tailoring really excites me or interests me the way that corsetry does. 
because it is just a thing of its own. There is nothing else that is so transformational. There, there, there there's nothing that, that has that psychological effect as well. So if you think about your favorite piece of clothing, whether it's a pair of shoes, a bag, a jacket, it can make you feel great but does it make you feel like a different person because that is what corsets do. So that that is where that passion really got funneled into really loving seeing people's reaction when they try a corset on and they stand straighter and they hold themselves and they they exude confidence and completeness that perhaps wasn't there before, particularly with my cross-dressing clients and my transgender clients who are looking for a physical representation of the person they feel they are. And that is an amazing gift to be able to give people um, to change their perspective. And, oh, I love my job. This, this thing is mostly just me saying, I love my job. And I hope that doesn't come across as being terribly smug. So Miss Sapphire Flame asks, is there a standard size you make your concept corsets to or do you have a model in mind? Well, anything that I make in the studio is going to be made with a 20 inch waist or a 22 inch waist if I don't have any one particular in mind to it. This is because I can fit those two sizes on my mannequin for taking photos and for developing it if I'm doing something a bit more complicated, but also I am a 22 inch waist and I'm basically exactly my own standard size so I can chuck it on me and get an idea of what it's doing on the body without bothering everyone else for their boobs like I usually do because you know I can't burn my bridges too much but um, yeah so if I'm not working with a particular model it's going to be a 20 or a 22 this is why our sample sales are flooded with 20s and 22s um, but if I'm planning a particular photo shoot, then yes, there will have been a model selected before I start work. So if there is a photo shoot, then I will be looking for a model who fits the aesthetic that I want to do for the shoot. If it's something very contemporary, if I want to do something romantic or classic, um, you're looking for somebody who in, just embodies that um, and hopefully also has the sort of similar photos in their work and their portfolio that you can refer to and go oh yeah i can i can see where this is going at which point the corsets will be made to that model's measurements and those pieces are so much fun to work on they really give you a chance to experiment a bit more with fit because you don't really want to be getting experimental with clients um, but with a model, you've got some opportunities to go, I wonder what happens if we do this. Hi, Galley Mix Spots. You sent me lots of lovely questions, so thank you for that. Your first one was, what is your timeline from idea to finished product and steps between? This is a complicated one to answer because the short answer is, it depends. If I'm making something from my shop, I understand the steps between those so innately, I know precisely what processes I'm going through and how to get the best results. So it's really streamlined. I think the most um, accurate way to answer your question is to talk about a photo shoot piece. So this would be a piece where I'm really working from a concept and not just repeating something I've done before. So it all starts with insomnia, <laughs> which is, you know, a really great way to be as a designer and you have clients to see at nine in the morning. Um, but I tend to wake up at about three or four in the morning and that's when I work through problems in my brain, um, what's left of it. So I'll be cursing myself whilst going okay but if I just tweaked that then I think that might work better I think it would look better on the body um what if I had some strap going around here um that is when I start boiling something down that's been bubbling away in my mind or that I've seen somewhere and wonder how that would work with corsetry so yay for 3 a.m um what comes after that or sometimes before it because it can be one or the other is falling for a fabric 
or an embellishment. Um, typically it's a colour with me. I'll, I'll fall in love with some fabric that I found and think, oh, what this suggests to me is a fantastic siren corset. Um, I'm not really a big sketcher, despite my background in illustration. Um, it just isn't how I work. I'm a really mentally visual person, so it's much quicker for me to effectively be dressing up a doll in my brain and moving colours, moving elements of design, wondering what happens if I take that taller, what happens if we drop that at the back. Um, so it's really more in my brain than in my sketchbook which is really unhelpful for clients because I can sketch it out but it's not really what I've got in my brain when I'm talking to you about it. Um, also playing with fabrics after that is quite a, again, it's, it's bringing together different colours and seeing how that affects the mood, um, how that affects my interpretation of things, so that's really interesting. Um, from there I'm starting to play with the pattern and if you're not familiar with sewing terms, a pattern is the paper pieces that we lay on the fabric to cut out. It's also, if you're working with a bespoke corset, entirely made to your measurements. And it's oh, pattern making I could talk about for hours, but we haven't got that. But so that from there we are twirling it, which is where we make a mock up of the pattern so that we can see how it fits the body, what the lines look like if we want to change anything. Working with that is such a great opportunity to break down what you thought was going to happen into the reality of limitations of fabric and physics. So <laughs> we do that. There's sometimes some paper experimentation on the mannequin where if I'm trying to create some interesting structures, that's how we do it. It's cutting out a load of paper and seeing how it bends and how it flexes and trying to recreate that with fabric. So at this point I've worked out that my grand scheme and idea isn't quite going to work out how I thought it would and I need to do some revisions uh, based on the twirls and based on experimentations on the mannequin, um, keep going through more twirls. There's, minimum three twirls, I think, for something quite complicated to get it through. So if you're working with a model, you're hopefully meeting up with said model and doing these twirl fittings in person so that you can really get an idea of the fit in person, just tweaking, pulling something into the side with your fingers so that you can see how that changes it. Most difference in the world, photos do not do the same thing, I promise you. So after that, I can actually start to make it. <laughs> um, once I've made something a few times, I have a much better idea of exactly what processes are going to work best with this material or with this shape. Um, when I'm making something quite experimental, everything is new. So it can take a lot longer to make something experimental because you will come across yet more problems that didn't really come through in the twirling process because maybe you weren't doing things to such a fine level, maybe you just weren't, and sometimes just the embellishment stage is too complicated and you need to simplify it. Um, the whole, so the real question there was about the time it takes and it's really hard to break it down because with a photo shoot piece I won't be able to dedicate the time exclusively to that. I'll be picking it up and putting it down in the evenings um, in between client commissions. But I would say if I compressed it all down into eight hour days, it would be around a month. Um, the quickest that I have turned around a new concept is a week. And that was because Vogue asked me to. So <laughs> I got a call from Vogue asking me to put together something around a brief, I had, well it was less than a week really because I had to post it, but yes, that was that was stressful, but it worked. So Love for Matt sent in a question. Love for Matt has been a supporter for a really long time, so thank you Matt. Almost since the start, I think, in fact. And he asked, how do you visualise how the curved 3D shapes translate into a set of flat panels? 
Um, well, it sort of starts the other way around, where I am beginning with the flats because of the pattern making. It's quite hard to explain how you know how it's going to work out. I think it's one of those things where the only true answer is experience, because you've worked with similar patterns and similar body shapes before, and you understand that when you take a line out just a little bit more dramatically at the hip, at the side, it's going to make a huge difference to the impression of that silhouette. Um, but pattern making is the real joy of corsetry for me, because it's so complicated and so simple, <laughs> but it's all a nuance. So two corset makers can sit down with the same set of measurements and make completely different shaping corsets from them because everything is about where you place the lines, how you distribute that, um, those measurements between each panel, how many panels you're using. Um, it's, it's a complete alchemy. That is the glory of pattern making. So I can't give you a really clear answer to that, unfortunately, other than to say, you just know. <laughs> you, you, and when you don't know, you twirl it and you discover where you went wrong and you fix it. The next question comes from Gally Makes Spots and she asks, how do you gather resources to inspire you? Well, as I've said, I don't really work like a proper designer. I don't have lookbooks. I don't sketch all the time. Um, and I don't go scouring museums for, you know, pieces to take inspiration from all the time. I do take inspiration from these things, but what I tend to start from with a new collection or a photo shoot is something I've really emoted to because I'm a horribly emotional person, as my friends will tell you. So there's nothing that gets me so inspired and so just shaking to make something as being in a landscape that I really respond to um, books. I've done collections about how much I love whales and one of my favourite books. So, um, and art, art is another thing that really comes in there and sometimes it's the way an artist uses colour or it can be so many things. The thing that's really burning in my heart to make at the moment is some pieces inspired by how much I love the sea. Um, and there are some amazing myths in Wales. I'm Welsh, this is Wales. Um, hi to everyone who isn't from Wales. Sorry to be you. There is these great myths about sea spirits, um, kind of similar to Selkies really. Um, I just love to make a collection that responds to those textures, those colours and the idea of these crazy little people just, you know, coming out the sea. I feel like I'm one of them, so it's, you know, that's what I want to make next. Um, but, so I did write some real things to answer to this other than to just talk about how much I love the sea, I promise you. Um, where I tend to be trying to channel this through is um, the aesthetic that I have for the business, which is, is one I share. It's, clearly not one I dress to, but um, the thing that I love to make for the business are fetish inspired pieces. There's real emphasis on femininity and grace and delicacy. Um, I really want to make pieces that you put on and you feel like your most elevated self. Um, and the fetish comes through that because um, I not that corsets are intrinsically erotic, but I think there is something so exaggerated and so dramatic about them, they naturally fall into that category. Um, and fetish is a great way to express that because there is so much openness in the community. There are wonderful, wonderful ways that that can be taken. Um, I'm not going to start going into it because YouTube doesn't like that. But, <laughs> um, the, the way that I really wanted to start, um, I, I, wanted a, I wanted a setting when I was designing. So I wanted to be imagining the, the beautiful things that people would be wearing to this particular party. And I keep coming back to this idea because it just seems to sum it up very well for me. And um, 
I'm imagining this um, like dizzying, debauched, masked ball. It's, you know, it's the light is coming low across the land. It's Midsummer's Eve, um, something quite ritualistic. Um, you know, there's a little bit of danger, there's a little bit of intrigue in the air. This, this party and this scenario is something that I just keep wanting to design for. So sometimes if things aren't in a collection, it's because someone's wearing it to the party. Our next question is from Elusive Elf and she wants to know, I think, I think you're a she, um, they want to know, how do you choose the fabrics that go into your corsets? Sometimes the fabrics are chosen by the clients. Um, mostly the fabrics are chosen by the clients. If I'm choosing something for myself or for a new design, the first thing has to be, is it appropriate for the use of this corset? So if I'm designing a waist training corset, that fabric has to be suitable for being worn every day. It can't smudge up easily. Um, these things have to be considered first for me. Um, also, if we're making something very luxurious, you know, where is it going to be worn? Is the way the light hits it going to be important? Are we looking for something that grabs attention? Are we looking for something quietly classic and refined? So purpose specific, I think is the most important thing. Um, but if I am just picking something to do an experiment with or something fun, it's always silk satin particularly silk, but really silk satin that I go to first. Um, if you haven't come across silk satin, oh my god, it, it's it's so textured, it's very smooth and lustrous, it, the way it catches the light, um, it almost glows from within, which makes the colour just shimmer and pop. Silk satin, every time, if in doubt, always silk satin. You've all been super patient. Uh, this is the last question, which is from Gally Make Spots again. And she wants to know, what are your main sources of information? Um, well, as I've said before with Corsetry, everybody does things differently. Um, I started off by gaining a lot of information from websites and from books. The most wonderful resources that I can recommend to you if you are looking to expand your knowledge of corset making. Um, first is Foundations Revealed, which is a magazine subscription website and they have live workshops with some of the greatest makers alive today. They also have um, regular articles written by working corset makers on different subjects. Sometimes it's something as specific as what is the best zip to use for a corset? Sometimes it's much more broad spanning, looking at different eras of corsetry, modern and historic as well. And you just cannot begin to imagine how much knowledge has built up there over the last 10 years or so. Um, also Patreon. Patreon is full of great makers. Um, who are sharing so much information and I find that so exciting and so liberating that we're not secret keeping, um, that we're being really generous with what we know. What, I have to say one of my favourite corset makers who is working at the moment is Royal Black. She is so experimental, her workmanship is so precise and clean and oh, oh, please go and look at Royal Black. <laughs> um, she is on Patreon sharing all of her skill, slowly, piece by piece, and remember these articles get deleted every month, so you have to just stay with these people so that you can gain all this wonderful information month by month. Um, Caroline Laskowska, I hope I'm saying your name properly, and if I'm not, I'm really sorry. Um, she also has a Patreon. Um, which is more lingerie based, but she shows her embellishment work on her corsetry, which is just an inspiring thing to drink in. She works with metal reef, she works with beads and feathers, and the corsets that she makes are really informed by her deep knowledge of history and um, the, the many extra pieces that she has collected, um, but with a really inventive contemporary twist you know when you're looking 
at a Royal Black or a Caroline Ruskowska piece because they are just so distinctive and they have so much personality in them that is from the maker. So I really recommend that you go and scour Patreon for your favourite artists, support them, but also go and learn from them because there is so, so, so much they want to share with you. Um, also, you can't fail to mention books. The one I recommend to everybody is Jill Salen. Uh, she has done a book on historic corsetry and a book on historic lingerie. Both are essential. You must own them both. They're wonderful. Uh, there are patterns in there. There is some detail on construction, but the photographs are enough to just flick through and gain so much insight because you can see whether a piece is hand stitched. You can see the cording detail. So, so much to drink in. Uh, also, Marion McNeely has recently released a book on corset cutting and making. Uh, I think it's on Amazon. Uh, it's wonderful. She has taken this historic book and turned it into a contemporary revisit, uh, trying to make these patterns, showing how they work on the body. Brilliant, really great. Go look for it. <laughs> I can't go through my sources of information without mentioning my friend Lisa who is the font of all wisdom. She is so skilled on so many different varieties that whenever... Varieties? So skilled on so many different topics that whenever I have an issue or I'm wondering how I'm going to approach something, the chances are Lisa knows. Um, and she... <laughs> so she will just sit me down and go, all right, okay, what you want to do is this. And call in her anatomical knowledge or her tailoring knowledge so I'm afraid that if you're looking at something clever I've done, the chances are that at some point or other, Lisa has told me something that I have put to good use. Um, so we all need a Lisa. I'm sorry she can't be there for all of you, um, but I'm very grateful she's there for me. Um, but that, that was all our questions. So I hope that that was interesting and it wasn't just pure waffle for everybody because I'm aware that I do talk a lot. Um, I certainly talk a lot for an introvert, but it has been really nice to see what things interest you about my work and corsetry in particular because it's such a varied pack in there. Um, I'd really love to know more about what you would like to see from the channel. Um, I'd love to answer some more of your questions. So if you wish you got in on this run, please email me. It's beth at orchidcorsetry.co.uk. Um, and I really just thank you so much for being here because um, there's something quite nervy about starting off a channel and hoping that people will come. It's like it's like making your own party, isn't it? And you know, just please come, please come to my party. Um, but before I've even released any real content, I know that some of you are finding me here and taking an interest. So I'm really grateful to you for that. May you never know how grateful. And please just keep talking, keep subscribing. Please share the page if you feel that this has been a worthwhile use of your time. And if not, tell me how to make it better. I'd love to know. Thank you and good night. <laughs>